Hey, how's it going? You're watching the Football Diary podcast. Thanks for joining us. Uh, it's the weekend where the Premier League finally has a break for the World Cup and players nervously wait on injury news and whether they can avoid any kind of scrapes in this most physical campaign yet. And a few have breathed a sigh of relief as they actually go to Qatar unscathed. But it has affected a few of the results. I think it's fair to say it's made this last game week going into the break a little bit different. Starting off with Brentford's win at Manchester City, uh, which nobody saw coming. But Ivan Tony must be rubbing his hands with glee at the message this sends out to Gareth Southgate, wouldn't he? Um, it was an incredible result, wasn't it, Miles? I'll start with you first. 98th minute winner. What a way to win a game. And really deserved as well, actually. Brentford were excellent in this game. City looked off the pace, not what we expect from them. But Brentford seemed to know how to hurt them. They were so good on the counter-attack. And not just because they were quick in what they did, but their passing movement was something that maybe resembled how Man City counter-attack very often. So, yeah, really, really good performance. A shame for Ivan Tovini that it might come a week too late. Yeah, there was new. There was kind of rumours that there was other reasons why he wasn't yeah. in the squad that weren't football related. Um, if so, that is a real shame. But it was a toss-up between him and Callum Wilson. And that kind of performance does make you sort of realise how much England could be missing with him up front. So I'll go to you, John. Welcome back to the pod, mate. What are England Thanks, missing with Ivan Tony being out of the squad? And what did he do to, to kind of make this game a wrap-up for, for Brentford going into this break? Because it was a great result for them, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, he's always been quite prolific in front of goal. And I was looking at his goal scoring record before the game, uh, sorry, before the pod. And a lot of the teams he scored against are actually quite good. He does, he's not one of the strikers that seems to perform against the lower end of the table. He's quite up for a big game. So if you look historically against who he scored against, I think likes of Chelsea over the last couple of seasons, uh, City now keeping his composure, Fox in the box, good pace, he's quite strong. Um, the whole not going on the plane to Qatar, I think, as you'd already mentioned, Mike, it being a toss-up between Callum Wilson and Ivan Tony. My, my personal opinion is they're quite similar. They don't really score these kind of screams from outside of the box. They're quite good physically. They can make nice runs in, uh, as Tony scored with his second goal. He was just really, that was the only thing on his mind was getting in the box and trying to get a tap in. Callum Wilson's quite good at that as well, like a bit of a, you know, poacher style finisher. So I think personally, Tony's got a bit more pace. I would have quite liked to see him to freshen it up a little bit and have someone that's completely different on the plane. I understand the reasons behind uh, Callum Wilson's not been in the squad since 2019. So, um, yeah, I guess we'll have to wait and see. But let's be realistic with these players. They normally end up as a bit of a filler unless there's an injury or something. So it'd be nice to see him play for more than, you know, 15 minutes if we need a win or something. But well, I guess we'll just have to wait and see what Southgate decides. Well, an emphatic message to Southgate, nonetheless, from Tony in this game. Uh, two really brilliant goals. I think the last one um, sealed a victory that Thomas Frank described as the greatest one in Brentford's history, which I think is bit of an exaggeration, but <laughs> in the context of, of, ex, of expectations versus reality, everyone had this down as one of those games that Haaland would probably leave for the break on a massive another goal haul again, um, that Brentford would struggle to do anything against this City team. But their tactics were, were spot on, really. You mentioned it, didn't you, Miles, as well, that the way they sort of bullied City with, with long balls over the top, um, the second ball City couldn't get to, um, they couldn't press them at all because they didn't have the ball for long enough. It was just launched straight over the top again. So a bit of an old school tactic there. But I'll go to you, Dave. What did you see in, in Brentford's setup that made you sort of go, do you know what? He had the tactics spot on there, Thomas Frank. Brentford did really... Good job on City, didn't they? Yeah, I mean, they clearly looked to exploit um, City's weaknesses. And we saw in the Liverpool game earlier in the season that their goal obviously came through an error through Cancelo, but it was just a direct long ball, really, that Liverpool took advantage. And there was a couple of instances where uh, Brentford used this strategy and like, beautifully, really. And they were probably a bit unlucky not to score more than the two goals that they did score. Um, and we saw that with the winner that, you know, City were completely exposed. They're obviously going for the winner themselves and it came back to bite them and the, it was a beautifully crafted goal. Um, and like you mentioned, Ivan Tony, I think the main thing with him at the moment, and I agree with John, I think they are quite similar, him and Callum Wilson, is T Tony's just a beast. I, I can see him really overpowering a lot of centre-backs. And I can't see Wilson doing the same. I don't think he's, you know, he lacks 
um, the imposing figure, but I just feel as though Tony's a different kettle of fish. And I, I agree, there's probably more going on behind the scenes than what it seems so um, at the moment with obviously non-footballing reasons. But it's also a bit strange that he obviously brought him into the squad in in the last internationals in the in the Nations League and didn't even give him an opportunity. I just thought that was bizarre, to be honest. But um, let's just hope he gets the opportunity in the future because you know he's lighting up the league. Um, there's not too many strikers in the league at the moment doing particularly well, and it's just nice to see another English striker other than Harry Kane doing well. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely true, and I think it will be. Small consolation for him, I think, that he is in such good form this season, Ivan Tony, because this was probably his one chance to get in an England squad and you never know if it's going to come up again. Mm-hmm. And that's the disappointing thing in some ways. But I'll come back to you, Miles, just to, just to sort of talk about City and the impact this has on their season now. Mm. Uh, I think everybody sort of earmarked Erling Haaland as, as like a, a captain here for their FBL teams, really, to get a few goals. Didn't I happen. Did that. He was contained. <laughs> yeah, many did. He was contained pretty well. And... Um, City struggled, didn't they? What does this mean for them? The five points adrift of Arsenal now. Mm. So they will go into this break feeling like this was a missed opportunity to stay in the pace, really, wouldn't they? Yeah, and I mean, you can't put it past City to make up five points. They've still got to play Arsenal twice, so there's your opportunity. But would you guarantee that you're going to win both those games? I don't think you can say yes to that. Arsenal are in fantastic form, and we have seen a couple of little wobbles from City. This team that everyone's certain is going to catch up and win the league. You have to win games like this. And actually, a lot of their players don't really have an excuse. Haaland isn't going to the World Cup. So this was his game to sign off on, like you say. You would have expected something from him. I know he's only recently coming back from injury, but this Brentford side hasn't necessarily been in the greatest of forms lately. Ivan Tony may have been, but they could easily slip further and further down the table. You can see that happening. And actually, they find themselves in a really good position now with a a marquee win for the season. And Man City are trying to catch up all of a sudden. The only thing that they can really take credit from was Phil Foden's goal was just absolutely fantastic. Like, to finish a ball that well, that bodes well for England, at least, even if uh, (laughs) John Stones' performance and Eric Dyer's don't necessarily. Yeah, I think the the way the table's taken shape, like you say, Brentford have had such indifferent form, some incredible yeah. results and some absolutely terrible ones, yet they find themselves, I think, in 10th, which is yeah. just the way the Premier League's pay, playing out this season. It's bizarre. And another kind of symptom of that as well is Newcastle finding themselves in, in third place, not even like by a bit. They're, they're quite comfortably in third now and they keep on winning, don't they? Uh, John, I'll go to you for this one. We haven't heard your take on, on Newcastle yet. We talked about Newcastle quite a lot when they were taking over every year ago now. Um, we didn't expect them to be this competitive this quickly, but are they in a title race now after beating Chelsea? I think title race is a bit of a stretch. I do, however, think <laughs> top four is pretty realistic. The reasons behind it are, if you look at Leicester, when they won the Premier League a few seasons ago and the way they ended that season, where they went on this kind of resurgence to avoid relegation, if you look at Newcastle's form the second half of last year, they then carried that through. The um, group chat I've got with you gentlemen and some of my friends as well, I'd said at the very start of the season that they will be there or thereabouts, uh, purely for the fact they didn't go silly in the transfer market. Uh You look at another team at West Ham that have brought in quite a few new recruits and they're still struggling to gel. I think Eddie Howe is very methodical in his you know, recruitment process and that's paying dividends now. They tried to do most of the business midway through last season and they've carried that through. They're not that far off the pace in fairness. So, you know, if you're third halfway through the season, that's an absolutely unbelievable achievement. And I'm sure Newcastle fans of old, when they used to have Shearer and Owen and like a fantastic team, you know, they're probably absolutely loving it at the minute and fair play to them because they've had many years of mediocrity. They've been relegated. So, yeah, I mean, fair play. It's really nice to see. Eddie Howe's a fantastic young manager. I think their recruitment, as I've said, has been spot on. They've had a few players that have just had this magical resurgence, mm-hmm. uh, people moving positions. You've got Amorian being unbelievable. I think he scored eight goals in the last 1,000 minutes and something ridiculous was mm-hmm. the start of that. I think it was 10,000 minutes he played before. It only scored nine. <laughs> so whatever the kind of stats are, 10,000 might be a bit extreme, but essentially <laughs> in 10% of the time, he's matched his goal totally. So yeah, really, really good. Trippier, you know, fantastic addition, mm-hmm. obviously on the plane for the World Cup. 
So yeah, I just I think they're a joy to watch. The Chelsea result was amazing. Um, I, if it went either way, in my opinion was they would probably get a result, whether that's a draw at home or a win. They actually got the win. They look quite comfortable for it as well. Chelsea just looked really disjointed. So yeah, yeah really nice to see a team that you know break in the top six mould. It. Yeah, I think so. For all of the negative press Newcastle have had, they're actually still got a lot of the players there that were there under Steve Bruce as well, which I think shows how good a job Eddie Howe's doing as a coach. You know, he's he's made Miguel Almiron, he's made Joe Linton better players, which is what coaches do, isn't it? And what they should do. So they're on merit a hundred percent. But Chelsea, Dave, what do you make of their season now? Graham Potter's had a bit of a wobble, it's fair to say, at the start of his tenure. He had a pretty positive first few games. But they lost three in a row now, I think, haven't they? They're looking a bit shaky all of a sudden, aren't they? I think we were mentioning it a few months back when Leicester were in trouble. Um, we were saying, you know, we were discussing the possibility of, of Graham Potter going there. And But midway through a season, the season that he was having with Brighton, the success he was having... Um, we, we just kind of wrote that off because we thought, why would he want to go into that mess? But look what mess he's in now. It, it's <laughs> that Chelsea team as well. And it's quite frightening, actually, to look at. And one of my friends said to me the other day, if you look at that Chelsea team, how many of those players would you have in the United team? And that's saying something. Mm. I mean, you've got Kovacic. Maybe, obviously, Reeves James is the standout. Is their best player by country mile. Um Mason Mount's not been the player that we've seen him be. I'll probably say arguably for the last 18 months, he's just been off it. Um, there's so much work to do to that team, not just the first 11, but the squad it needs a complete mm. rebuild. And it's a monster task, even for, for Potter. Um, obviously, really, really a, a really good manager. And, you know, he's got, had all the credit for the work that he's done at at Brighton and in his time there he's, he's done so well but it's kind of a different kettle of the fish in in a club like this and like Chelsea um, I just hope that he gets the time to do it because we don't know whether he's going to get the time with these owners um, we saw how they treated they treated Tuchel, now that's looking like a decision for me probably the wrong decision and we even said it at the time, it was very hard so you're talking about a monster rebuild though, Dave, and they spent a fortune in the summer. So, I mean, what kind of rebuild do they need from here on in, Miles? What, what, what more does, does Potter need at his disposal? No, a, a lot. I think people are being very reactionary with Potter, if I'm totally honest. They have lost mm. three in a row, but they were to the current Premier League top three. And now, of course, Chelsea want to be in, a, in amongst that. So you have to at least take a point from those games or not get knocked out of the cup. I know that that would be their hope, but You've got a new manager in who hasn't managed at this level before, but is clearly an excellent coach. He's not had a transfer window yet. He's not had that long to get to know his squad. It's been a really hectic schedule. I think I saw something ridiculous. Like Chelsea have played 30 games in the last six, seven weeks, I think. Which is, that's, that's a lot of football to be getting used to in the middle of what's already a very congested season. So there are mitigating circumstances around this. And actually... Chelsea have spent money, you're right, but in all the wrong places and their sporting strategy has been really poor. Bowley came in and just threw money here and there without actually thinking of a coherent plan and then sacked the manager shortly afterwards. So, of course, it's going to need a rebuild. The worrying part of that rebuild is one thing that seemed like it was already in place was someone like Kukurea, who was under Potter last year. And now he isn't even starting for Chelsea, despite spending £60 million for him. They're playing a young kid. And Chelsea have been hampered with some injuries, particularly at wing-back. Missing Reese James is massive. Missing Ben Chilwell is massive. Mm. I do think Potter will get this together. It's been four out of five that they've lost, but four very difficult fixtures. He's dealing with a lot of difficulty in the squad, some ageing players. He clearly hasn't had time to get his philosophy, his tactics, his players in there. They've now got a 45-day break and then a transfer window opens five days after that. So let's see where Potter is by the end of February, March before we start talking about is he under any pressure? I think that's got to be the way they've got to move forward. Yeah, I think with the players they've got as well, um, they're not Potter players, are they? And I think whose players are they? They weren't even two core players to an extent. I don't even think they're that good either. I looked at, like Dave mentioned then, and I, I thought exactly the same thing. I looked at this weekend's lineup. 
And I thought, I can't believe this is a Chelsea team. And a particular team that spent as much money as they have. Because the quality, I couldn't find it. Who's their creative player? Who's their leading goal scorer going to be? It's not going to be Brozier. Like, he had a good season last year at Southampton. Let's be honest. He's not going to be Chelsea's number nine come next season. I'd put money on that. Conor Gallagher, he was at Crystal Palace last year and had a good season. These are players that have all had to take a massive step up to play for Chelsea now. And actually, I think we're seeing that some of them might not be ready for that step. This lineup was really, really poor, partly down to injury. I'll give you that. But I, d- I don't think we can have very high expectations of Chelsea right now, if I'm totally honest. Selling Lukaku and letting Lukaku go. It just shows you've got a big name. You've got a player who's capable. You haven't made it work. You've ruined that player a little bit. And you've not moved on from it effectively. You've just panicked. And now you're seeing Sterling out of form. Pulisic can't find his feet. Havertz doesn't know whether he's a number 10 or a striker. Chelsea just mm. need to just start again, basically. Let a lot of those players go. Ziyech, Pulisic, they need to find new clubs. And really think about what kind of forward line are we going to build in particular? Because they, they just didn't look like they were going to create anything in this game either. It was really poor. Yeah. It puts Potter under unnecessary pressure so early yeah. in his, his Chelsea career. I think we've all got high hopes for him to mm-hmm. to kind of produce the kind of um, form at this level that we think he can. Because tactically, he's always proven to be really flexible, astute kind of manager. He's finding his feet at this level, isn't he? With the players he's got, uh, trying to adapt to a club that demands results now. Um, and it's been difficult for him. So I really do hope he can come out of that period of pressure as soon as this uh, the Boxing Day fixtures start again because they do come pretty much straight after the World Cup then yeah, really games which is which is insane but mm. from one manager who's seemingly under pressure to another I think who's not under enough pressure for my liking that's Frank Lampard I feel like Everton are so poor this season they've had a few mm. flashes of, of, of decent defensive performances especially but they can't attack they've got no strikers they saw Neil Morpé as their kind of their answer to their goal scoring worries, which is insane. Um, and they got thumped three 0 by by uh, Bournemouth this weekend, and deservedly so. So, John, what have you made of Frank Lampard's Everton this season so far, mate? I mean, Miles are probably well. He may agree or disagree, but there's similarities between Lampard and Gerard Stanisher. I think where they're both really big players, massive personalities, achieved a lot personally. And they've got these big positions off of smaller jobs that really they probably haven't done for long enough. It was just they had six months a year, 18 months in these positions, looked quite good in the lower leagues. And then like, okay, let's give them a crack. It's no problem. Stick with them for a little bit. But whether the mysticism around them gets lost a little bit, so that wears off quickly six months in where the players are like, wow, they're coming in like starry-eyed. I've got this guy as a manager and he's absolutely unbelievable. Look at the stuff he's achieved and they're all motivated off the back of that. I think that only gets you so far. And we've seen it historically as well when you've got these really world-class players that go into manager positions. Very few of them. Can you? I mean, apart from Zidane was obviously ridiculous where he won three Champions Leagues in a row. But if you look even around Europe, there's not really been a sustained successful coach that was a world-class elite player. It just hasn't really happened. And they seem to be suffering from that a little bit. So whether it is the tactic side of it or they don't have the kind of grit and things necessary to perform at that level. I mean, Everton have been terrible, let's be real. Um, I mean, I know you mentioned Chelsea there with their team and had a lot of injuries. Everton haven't really had that many. They've not recruited well at all. Uh, Richarlison was great. but must be rubbing their hands. 50 million, thank you very much. What did they do with the money? Like nothing. Yeah. I think they've actually recruited poorly in the last few seasons. Didn't they spend like 30 million on a Wobi or something ridiculous? There's a couple of players. He's been their best player. He, yeah, in fairness, he has. I'm not saying that, you know, but that's still a lot of money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and the, there's a few others they bought on the fringes that have been similar kind of these big money signings for whatever reason, 25 to 40 million, and they've just done absolutely nothing. Yeah, I think um, Everton and, fans kind know, of showed how they felt, didn't they, at the end of the game, where they were really sort of. Uh, confrontational towards the Everton players who, you know, fair play to them. They did kind of almost apologise to them, walk up to them and go, you know, that wasn't good enough. They couldn't really do right for doing wrong there because if they'd have just gone straight down the tunnel, they'd have been criticised as well for not kind of holding their hands up and going, that wasn't good enough. But uh, Iwobi actually had a stinker in this game as well. So again, this inconsistency is really catching up with them. And Frank Lampard, is he any good? What's a Frank Lampard team look like? It's still all these questions I've got no answer to. Whereas Bournemouth, you can see you can see <laughs> the identity of Bournemouth with Gary O'Neill in charge after a few games. I think 
this looks like his last game in charge, which is a real shame. Mm. I think they'll bring in someone like Bielsa, apparently, is reported to be linked with the Bournemouth job, which would be a bit mental, wouldn't it? But uh, mm. Dave, what do you make of, of Bournemouth surge up the table? Because I think they're, what, 13th now, something like that, but they look comfortable at the moment. I say at the moment because it can change quite quickly, but Bournemouth, it'd be a shame to see O'Neill go, wouldn't it, if, if this is how it's going to play out? Oh, yeah, he's done you know, a spectacular job in the short time that he's been in the role that he's in. And like you mentioned there, he's probably not going to be in that position for much longer. I think if we look in, you know, back into the past where managers have been given roles permanently on the back of, you know, a mini new manager bounce and it's not gone on and worked, you probably have to say it's probably the safe and the right thing to do in that Bournemouth coming into the season were probably thinking we'll do well to stay up this season. They've put themselves into a very good position um, coming up to Christmas um, with that many games played. And so I think they'll actually take their chances. And if they do get a good, you know, a very competent manager, you mentioned Bielsa there, he might he could come in there and galvanise that squad straight away. And if, if who knows, he might even look to keep Gary, Neal as, Gary O'Neill as a as part of that, you know, that coaching team. Um, he's obviously Absolutely. doing something mm. wrong as well. So I think that would be a very, a very clever thing to do um, for any incoming manager. Like you mentioned there, they've played really, really good ball, very easy on the eye. Um, and you'd have to say with a lot of those plays in there, you probably wouldn't say that some of them are Premier League managers. It almost kind of brings technically back to when Sheffield United first came into the Premier League and, we, you know, we we never gave them a chance, really. Um, so it'd be interesting to see. Obviously, it's so it's so tight down there at the bottom. Um, so we'll, we'll see what happens in the new year. Obviously, the transfer window to come. You'd fancy a lot of the teams down there to to, uh, to invest in their squads as well. So it's going to be interesting yeah. after uh, after World Cup. Everton maybe are looking at what Bournemouth have done this season and thinking maybe we should have been a bit. Uh, a bit more like this because when Parker got sacked we all thought that was quite harsh at the time and it seemed Mm -hmm. very quick to make that decision and it's worked out incredibly well for them and Everton seemed to have stuck with Lampard despite really they stayed up last season on fumes really and by the fact that there were three teams worse than them every now and again they pulled one performance out of the bag where they really needed to but how much of that was Lampard? How much of that is his tactics? How much of that is just the pressure of the situation? You never know. And there have been spells this season where defensively they've looked a lot more sound. And we've been praising the acquisition of Connor Cody and James Tarkovsky. And Cody's even found himself in the England squad, which a lot of people might have questioned with the amount of centre-backs that have missed out. So there have been signs, but is Lampard utilising this squad in the way that he should? I also look beyond him. You have to. I don't want to sound like a broken record. We've talked about this before. But if you're spending £30 million on Dwight McNeil, who got zero goals, zero assists for Burnley as they got relegated, if you're bringing in Neil Morpai from a Brighton team that looked fantastic but couldn't score goals and you've brought in their striker, if you're bringing in Andre Gray, who's had... Uh, Damari Gray, sorry, who's had spells in his career where he's looked decent but he's never been consistent, mm. I don't know what you expect from your team because what's Everton's level right now they must be looking at a team like Brighton flying up the league and thinking how have we found ourselves here because it's doable in this league if you invest well you can make real successful moves up the table and Everton have got the infrastructure they've got the fan base they're looking at a new stadium they've got the history but instead risk genuinely falling out of the Premier League if they don't act soon Mm. I'll be surprised if we hear that Lampard's sacked, to be honest. Yeah. It's turned. And I saw it at Villa. When John makes a comparison with Gerard, it's almost annoying to make that comparison because they've had it their whole careers. But it is really similar. He's completely right. And the way that it's gone is really similar. The fans are gone now. The fact that they were yeah. throwing... They threw a Wobi shirt back at him when he put it in the crowd. That interaction told me everything you need to know. He's, he's got to go now. But I don't think the board will act because A, it'll be expensive. B, I don't know who their better option is. And C, I don't know if Everton know what they want right now. Even if they could get a new manager in, would they go for a Sean Dice to try and keep them up? Would they go for a foreign appointment to try and bring in some sort of philosophy? Who knows? They don't know. 
you can see from their recruitment strategy on the playing side, they don't know what they want. And it's it's going to cost them massively. Whereas Bournemouth on the other side, I feel like they might be about to make a really bad decision too. Gary O'Neill should have the mm. season. That's my opinion. I probably yeah. wouldn't give him a long contract. As Dave's right, we've seen play, um, we've seen standing managers have immediate success and then fall off. But right now, the most important thing for Bournemouth is stay up. If they finish 17th this season, they will be ecstatic with that. And the financial benefit of doing that and being able to reinvest and start again in the summer, that's the time to hire a manager, I think. I, Bielsa yeah. is, is not the man for this job. He'll need resources. I don't think the players that he has there... You can't see Kiefer Moore playing a Bielsa press. I'll be totally honest. So... I think they've got to be really careful not to upset the harmony that they finally developed or they could find themselves where Everton do, where they've not really planned for this. They've not got a coherent squad. They've got the wrong manager appointed and they're going to fall apart. And I wouldn't be surprised if we saw both of them locked in a relegation battle come the end of the season based on their, their next moves managerially. Yeah, well, the bottom 10 could be a few points between them till right at the very end. Yeah. So it could be a really interesting relegation battle if things continue as they are. Um, but another team that seems to be sucked into that relegation battle, if we can touch on them quickly, is, is West Ham. Uh, who welcome back, were being... <laughs> Welcome back, John. Yeah, indeed. Beaten by a resurgent Leicester City team, which we'll come on to in a moment. But can you just kind of outline as briefly as you can, John, why West Ham are in this predicament? Because they've spent pretty big and they've bought some very recognisable names. So what's happened so yeah. far? I tried to allude to it a little bit already, so I didn't go off on a massive ran for 10 minutes <laughs> but uh, the, inv- <laughs> the investment's been really sound I think they've actually been quite deliberate and they've spent money where they want to spend money which is great but I think because they bought in so much new talent it takes time to gel and I don't I think with the World Cup and people having players having eyes on that like Byron for example you can see it's been weird to watch them this season where mm. you can see they're getting frustrated when they're playing if something doesn't quite work out or the ball doesn't drop they're kind of a lot of them are throwing like many tantrums on the pitch where you can see them half and they're kind of like giving up a little bit, you know? Whereas last season, they, they didn't have that. They didn't seem to have this weight bearing on their shoulders. It was just very much, they had the team they had. You know, they were playing the same team pretty much week in, week out, as you know, with very, very few changes. So, of course, you work out how you play with your peers. Uh, they had fantastic chemistry, synergy, whatever you want to say the last couple of years. They brought in the new recruits. I thought they'd be maybe layered in a bit more gradually, but to be honest, it has been a few games and just bang. Suchek's been massively out of form in the centre of the park. Uh, he needs to make some brave decisions by dropping him. He saw um, Ben Rama the other day, got subbed off, the crowd booed because he was our best player by a mile. Uh, that wasn't actually against Leicester. It was a game before when we lost um, 2-1 against Palace. But I just think a few of them look really flat. Uh, there's a couple of shining lights, but I just haven't gelled as well as I think they were hoping. Do I think Moyes is a problem? Not yet. Mm. But I think five, six games in the new year, like a lot of the managers we're talking about, that'll be that. If I don't get some results, I think there'll be some big questions asked. And as a fan, I can't complain. I just wish they'd staggered their recruitment a bit more like Newcastle. So yeah. blood people in gradually rather than have the influx of the four or five players. I personally don't think that ever works. Dave, can I take your word on on how you think Leicester have turned it around so far as well? After the last few games, they've tightened up defensively hugely. And I think Rodgers has even said that he's had to just go back to basics on the training ground. You can really see that that coming to fruition, can't you, for them? Because they've been difficult to score against. How how have they changed, Dave, from when we were talking about Brendan Rodgers potentially being in his final days? It seems like a long time ago, but it actually wasn't. They've turned it around in pretty quick time, really, and they had to. Yeah, it only took them 18 months to uh, sort out their uh, set pieces. and. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when you say he went back to um, basics on the training ground, why Why is he only doing that now? Why didn't he do that sooner? Yeah, I think um, I think the, the new signing centre-back, Fass, who's actually taken to the league a lot, a lot quicker than I thought he would, um, he's made that departure of uh, Fafana like it almost feels like I'm sure Leicester fans have probably forgotten all about Fafana now. And uh, I did say, obviously, we we spoke earlier on in the season about Leicester, and I know you guys were sort of sceptical of whether they would have enough to stay in the league. And the chips were down. They looked, they looked so. You know, a lot of their players just looked ball at sea. They looked like their minds were elsewhere. And I, I just had a feeling. I thought 
I think if they've got to keep him in the job and fair play to, to Leicester, like not many not many clubs would have kept Brendan Rodgers in that role. Um and we're now starting to see a lot of players um the form it upturn in form, Tillemans scored some absolute ridiculous goals in the last two or three weeks. Um James Madison's obviously the standout player. What a player he's, he's turning out to be. Rattled into the top of the net by who else? James Madison. I'm sure we've seen some, we've seen little moments from Madison over, you know, the last few years, and we're just wondering whether he can piece it all together. And he's just really contributing so much to this Leicester team at the moment, and everything's just falling for him. It's it's kind of like he's a he's won the jackpot and it's almost all coming together for him um, at the perfect yeah. time, just before obviously the World Cup as well. Um, so, yeah, um, I mean, they must be looking to the, the January transfer window because no doubt they do need to probably bring in a couple of uh, a couple of players just to help with their depth. They're, they've got so many players that are injury prone and just seem to get recurring injuries as well. So, I think they probably need another midfielder, um, maybe another centre back as well, just because they just had so many different lineups. And they, I'd love to know the amount of different lineups they've had, especially their back four over the last year. Uh, I hate to be really sceptical about this, but I'd argue a couple of things. One, I don't know how brave it was of Leicester to keep Rogers. I think financially their hand was forced. Two, I haven't seen Tielemans sign a new deal yet. So he could be off in January. That has to be a massive worry for Leicester. Three, I'm fairly convinced Newcastle will sign James Madison in January as well. And then all of a sudden, you've got a real problem on your hands. And four, the only way Leicester are going to make moves in January is by selling at least one of those two players, surely. Because mm. otherwise, how do they how do they make this squad better? It's great to see Leicester up the league. I think they have done really well. They were so far adrift at one point. And it is a bit reminiscent of Newcastle. When, when Eddie Howe took over and how they started to climb, build a bit more team spirit, be a bit more organised to start with. Nothing too flashy, just organised. But the difference is Newcastle did that and then had a financial platform to kick on. Leicester, mm. I worry that it might go up and then come straight back down again once once the, the reality of the situation hits. Yeah, potentially. Um, a lot going to happen really once the World Cup's finished and we don't know what kind of impact the World Cup itself will have on the Premier League and, and the rest of world football. So interesting to, to, to watch that mm. unfold. Uh, Dave, while I'm still on you actually, I just want to pick your brains on, on Manchester United, not Cristiano Ronaldo. That's that's a pod for another time, I think. That's a whole other kettle of fish and dramas, isn't it really? But I just want to talk about... Um, the young version of Ronaldo, which is Alejandro <laughs> Garnacho, who scored a late, late winner against Fulham. And United were quite lucky to go and out that win because Fulham played well. But Garnacho looks a real prospect, doesn't he? No pressure on the poor kid. Oh, certainly, yeah. Um, you try not to hype up you know, young players these days. And I think Ten Hag's doing a really good job of, of not doing that. He's you know, doing all the right things, not taking him out of the limelight, not letting him go into... Like Post match interviews, things like that, which I'm sure broadcasters would, would obviously love and jump on the chance of. And um, it certainly seems like some of the players are taken under their wing. Um, I know Alessandro Martinez, obviously, his fellow countryman, is kind of seen as like a big brother, um, apparently, what's been said. So the only worrying thing for me is his biggest idol is Cristiano Ronaldo. And he's probably not the big, mm. the best role model to have right now. But, um, yeah, I've. Honestly, such a talent. And from when I when I went to the Youth Cup final, which he obviously scored the winner against Notts Forest in, I think one thing that stood out to me is that he's just not scared to be on the ball. He always wants the ball, um, which is quite rare for me for for a young a young player. And it's something that obviously Tenag mentioned him having that sort of arrogance and not in a bad way, but knowing that you're good you're good enough to make a difference at a team, not just any team, but at Man United. And that is yeah. a real rare trait I feel, um, to have. He's so quick. like He's, he's almost got that low centre of gravity. He's not the tallest player in the world, but you, you look at that acceleration that he had over those five or six yards, he was he was not the favourite at all to get to latch onto that ball from Ericsson. It almost looked too heavy of a through ball from Ericsson. But he, it was literally just the drive that he had to get on the end of it. And it was just so coolly finished. 
I'm going to finish the pod actually with uh, hero, villain, and goal of the week as well. And it's my turn to pick them this time. I just want to get your your guys' opinions on it. Really, hero of the week. I've gone for somebody who's had such horrendous luck in in the last decade or so. I would say, and that is Mario Goetze. So take, it's going to the World Cup, and he's missed so many tournaments through injury that I've got to say this is one of those feel good stories that I didn't see coming. Um, you're Big Dortmund fan, aren't you, Miles? What do you make of, of the way this has played out for him? Oh, it's brilliant. The resurgence of his career is it's not just by circumstance either. Like he was so good in his time in Holland. And coming back into Germany was a big step alone. So being at the World Cup, I know there's Argentina fans who were crying about the prospect of him being there and have haunting memories of him. So a brilliant story. A shame when you consider that. Royce is going to miss the World Cup again through injury. But having yeah. Goethe in there at least is that, that feel-good factor, like you say. And it's there on merit. He's an experienced pro now. He's a really good midfielder and he will yeah. do a job. I don't think he'll start games, of course, but he's an impact player and, he, and he's very calm. I think he'd be a good presence to have there. And who better to have around some young players like Musiala than someone who's scored a winning goal in a World Cup final? Absolutely. That's a brilliant thing to take forward. My villain of the week, um, I don't know how you feel about this, but... Every time I've watched him play lately, I, I, I sort of cringe a little bit. And now he's in the England squad. He's in the spotlight even more. And that's Eric Dyer. He was absolutely mm. terrible against Leeds. Such a liability. He's playing in this sweeper position. And it really worries me that they've got Maguire and Dyer, who are pegged as like England centre-back prospects. I'm thinking that's just the most catastrophic combination, isn't it? I hope they get nowhere near the starting lineup together, especially. But yeah, Eric Dyer for me is, is, is the one, I think, is, is, is villain of the week. I think he stands out as a, a calamitous performance, to say the least. Uh, and my goal of the week, you've already touched on it, actually. Phil Foden, I just think the way he took mm. that on the half volley, wasn't it? The ball kind of came across him. And you could see his eyes watch it in slow motion as it floated, bounced, and then he struck it beautifully smashed it into the roof of the net. It was an incredible finish. And that bodes well for England as well, that Phil Foden's playing such good football, even when City aren't sometimes. He's still kind of their main man at such a young age. So, yeah, that looks really good too. He starts for England, doesn't he, in the first Absolutely, game? Absolutely, yeah, 100%. To. We will talk yeah. more about England's squad and, and potential starting 11s in, in another pod, if you guys can join me for that. But uh, that's of it course. for now, guys. Uh, good to see you, John. Thanks for, thanks for coming back again, mate. Hopefully not uh, the last time for a while. No, I'll definitely be back. Thank you. Uh, and thank you once again for watching, listening. And yeah, please do hit like, subscribe and everything you can, else you can just to support our growth. Take it easy, guys. Speak soon. Cheers. Cheers.